I'd like to welcome, welcome you all here this evening. Nice to see you all. And I'd now like to ask the Reverend Kim Leafy to lead us in prayers. Pray for the well-being of the remaining tables this evening. It is a joy to be with you as you gather here again this evening. And uh, I invite you now to join me as we commend this pie over to the Lord. So let us pray. Dear wise and loving Father, we say thank you for the many and abundant blessings. We thank you for life itself, for the measure of our health, for sustenance and for friendship. We thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honour of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Amen. Lord, in the scriptures you have said that people ought to obey the governing authorities, since you have established those very authorities to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, I pray for Mike and for the assembled council, and I am asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern a sense of welfare and the true needs of the people, a keen thirst for justice and righteousness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement, and for personal peace in their lives and a joy in their task. I pray for the agenda set before them today, Please give an assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved Rochford. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to pray the Lord's Prayer, and if you would like to join in with this <coughs> prayer, then please do do so. Our Father, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this night and forevermore. Amen. Go well. Have a good evening, Mike. Thank you. God bless, bless you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, please be seated. Members, apologies, I uh, omitted to do the evacuation instructions before I introduced our chairman. So, should we be required to evacuate the building, would you please leave the building via the rear doors to the hall? Turn right, go through the two sets of double doors to the car park where it is the assembly point. Please do not delay your evacuation to collect any belongings. Please do not return to the building until given permission to do so by council staff. Please note that the meeting will be audio recorded. Please switch off mobiles or turn them to silent. Thank you. <coughs> Members, when I invite you to speak, please wait until the microphone is in front of you before speaking, as, as the microphones are needed for the hearing loop and the audio recording. I would remind members, though, if you, even if you're not speaking, the microphones are switched on and we'll st pick you up, still pick up if you're speaking and you're not actually speaking. They're already switched on, so all you need to do is to adjust them and please make sure the microphone is directly in front of you before speaking. 
Members, voting will be done by a show of hands in line with the Constitution. And I'll ask for a show of hands, then, uh, then against the recommendation, and then for abstaining. Given the size of the room and the number of us present, can I please ask that you put your hands up clearly, remembering what it was like when you were at school, high in the air, so you can easily be seen by all and leave it and up until you're asked to lower it. The normal rules of debate apply. No member should speak or for any longer than five minutes. And can I please ask you not to repeat anything previously said? All those indicating to speak will be given an opportunity to speak once. Right, agenda item one, apologies for absence. I have councillors uh, A.G. Cross, J.N. Gooding, Mrs. J.R. Gooding, and T.D. Knight, and councillor Jack Lawman, and councillor June Lumley. Members, the item two, the meeting of the annual meetings held on the 17th and the extraordinary meetings held on the 14th of June. Are you happy for me to sign these minutes of the annual meeting held on the 17th of May and the extraordinary meeting held on the 14th of June? Is that agreed, members? Okay. Agenda item three, declarations of interest. Are there any... In declarations of interest. I remind you members, if anything should come up during the course of the debates, please indicate at the time and we will make the necessary note. Agenda item four, agenda item four, announcements for the chairman, leader or head of paid service. Um, I'd like just to take this opportunity of saying a few words. Um, those were at the garden party, and I thank you all for coming along that did the garden party, uh, will know my chosen charities, but those that weren't able to attend, it is Trust Links, who are based in Rochford, and Advancement Through Football um, th in Great Wakering. I've got a couple of events that will be coming up. Um, well, the first one is on the 28th of August, and it is a riverboat cruise uh, from the paper mill lock to Haybridge Basin. Um, if anybody wants any details, if you'd like to see Councillor Williams after the meeting, he will have all the details, or myself. I also plan to have perhaps a couple of um, quiz nights during the course of the, the year. And I've been over to Fowness today on another matter and had a chat with the Heritage Centre there and hopefully, with the permission of the D, uh, MOD, we may be able to do a tour around Fowness Island for those that have never been to Fowness. It's a fascinating place. Um, it's very historic and uh, it's very interesting to visit. Okay, thank you, members. Is there, did the leader wish to make any announcements? Just to clarify. Thank you. Okay, agenda item five. <clears throat> Presentation of a petition in pursuit to proceed under rule 11. Members, we have a petition to be presented this evening and this will be presented by Mr. Steve Tellis who will have a total of five minutes to present it. I'll call, I'll call you in a second, Mr. Tellis. After that, members, we will have a total of 15 minutes in which to debate the petition. I will ask the portfolio holder for housing assets and ledger, Councillor Webb, to respond to the petition. 
in the first instance, and then invite members to contribute to the debate. As we only have 15 minutes in total, I want as many members as possible to have an opportunity to speak. I would like to move a motion without notice to reduce the speaking time for each member to two minutes for this item. Do I have a second? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Members, do I have, have your agreement to that? A show of hands, those in favour? Please lay your hand. Those against? Okay, please lay your hand. Any abstentions? Okay, okay members, uh, that's four, 22 against three, and three abstentions. Okay, Mr. Tellis, you now have the opportunity at the, uh, please come forward, um, if you, just to advise you, we'll have an opportunity at the end of the debate to sum up for the maximum of one minute, if you wish to do so. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, councillors. Thank you for giving me time to present this petition from over 2,000 local people, 2,024 to be exact, both online and in hard copy. They all wanted to save both Mill Hall and Civic Suite with its gardens and council debating chamber. This petition has been a long time in coming it started back in 2021, but was significantly delayed by your PERDA rules in early 2022. Since the, uh, since the petition's inception, we know Council have dealt with some of the aspects that are uh, uh, some of the aspects, but there are some key issues called for in the petition that remain unaddressed. It is indeed unusual that I stand before you now seeing all your pleasant faces in this school hall. And I, I do note your new layout, which is commendable, but normally, like most residents, I'm at the back seeing only uh, the councillors from the back. Nothing wrong in your backs, I, I must hesitate to say, but that is the way, is that really the way to conduct a public debate on important local issues? Is it not ironic that you have an historic custom-made debating chamber with a public gallery, microphones and comfy seats a mile away in the centre of the biggest town in our district, that li which lies empty while you hire this hall for public meetings? This is why 2024 taxpayers have petitioned to save both Mill Hall and the Council Chamber. This is what they say. We, the undersigned, are opposed to the sale and demolition of Mill Hall Rayleigh and the sale of Rayleigh Civic Suite, including the Council Chamber. We hereby petition Rochford District Council to carry out a full public consultation on the same, on the sale of these publicly owned buildings and to abide by the results of that public consultation. Now, we recognise that the consultation since the inception of the uh, petition has in fact happened, but it's this abiding bit that worries us, especially regarding the civic suite, council chamber and gardens in Rayleigh's conservation area. 
I hope you can give residents your support for, the, uh, for saving these buildings and this landscape in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tillis. Please, have a seat. Councillor Webb, can I please invite you to respond to the petition and you have up to two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I reserve the right to comment at the end of the debate. However, I would like to propose a motion that no further action is taken. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next speaker I have is Councillor Wilkinson. Oh, hang on a second, yes, Councillor sir, Wilkinson. Yeah. Sorry, I need a seconder for that motion. I think Councillor Wooten had his hand up first, I think. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to second that motion, and if I may also reserve my right to speak later in the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, sorry. Thank you, Chair. I hope I'm able still to say what I was going to say, now that we're now speaking to the motion that's on the table. Um, I, I would like to just address the, um, the fact that the, the issues to do with the civic suite, if I may, because obviously the Mill Hall has been subject to discussions within the executive. The leader and I have had a number of conversations about the civic suite, and I think he knows where I stand on it, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not uh, in support of the plans that we have before us. What I would like to propose, and I don't know how as a council we could move this foot go, going forward, is um, we're in a bit of a quandary, really, because um, we saw at the last partnership panel meeting, and I hope I don't speak out of turn when I say this, that the, with the price of material, building materials going in one direction, <coughs> the, the price for state not quite reaching it, our funding gap for the freight house is growing as we speak. And it may get to the point where we can't afford to do what we want to do at the freight house. So we need to keep an, a backstop. We need to keep something there, because what if we can't deal with use the freight house? Then if we sell the civic suite, then we've lost our council chamber. And I wonder, if at this time of uncertainty, whilst we go through the process of dealing with the freight house, if we can press the pause button on the civic suite. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Newport. Again, Councillor Newport, you have two minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, given the motion on the, on, on the table, I'll follow uh, Councillor Wilson's lead, uh, Wilkinson's lead with um, not really speaking to the motion. But, um, firstly, I feel it is right to thank Councillor Wooten that for, for the foreseeable, I will never again have to have so many photos taken outside one building. And finally, the Mill Hall will be returned to the community and with a long, sustainable plan for its future in the pipeline. It will not have escaped your attention that the residents of the district do not like the changes that were planned and rightly so rejected the plans of this council to close the Mill Hall. But I do feel we must turn our attention to the rejection of the planning, to, to their rejection of the planning proposals for the housing and offices at the Civic Suite. It goes further than this though. Rayleigh Town Council also outright rejected the plans. Although the planning permission has now been granted for the development of housing, all is not yet lost. Whilst we have the chance, we should not be dead set on a course of no return, unlike in other planning decisions. In this case, we do have a chance to seize the opportunity and realise that we are the masters of our residents' destiny and aren't at the mercy of developers. This council has a chance to redeem itself and bring about some common sense in its decision making. Reopening the Mill Hall is the first step in regaining the trust that has been lost between elected members and residents, but it is a baby step. Does the leader not agree with me now? It is the time to stop wasting council taxpayers' money on hiring venues to hold meetings and training sessions when we do have a perfectly good taxpayer-owned facility at our disposal. I would like to propose... Councillor Newport, I'm going to have to ask you can to... Can I just wrap up with one sentence? As left. quickly as you can. Please. I would like to propose that a full socio-economic analysis is carried out into reopening the civic suite and the matter brought back to the next meeting of the full council. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Is there any, any, anybody else? Councillor Sperry. Councillor Sperry. Thank you, Chairman. 
Having been a resident of this town, Braley, since the late 50s, I'm very much aware of the nostalgia that is attached to this civic suite. Unfortunately, it is it surplus to the council's requirements these days. It is not the most suitable place to conduct business, in my view, never has been. And I would point out, as Mr. Trellis pointed out, sitting at the back here, you're looking at the back of our councillors, it's exactly the same in the civic suite. With regard to other aspects, I think we just come down to, sadly, the situation of, of economics. We've looked, the world has changed with COVID and all the rest of it. The council's structure has changed. The way we operate, everybody has changed. And I'm afraid we have buildings now that were built many, many years ago, have served their time, but now are surplus to what the new council or the council moving forward will need. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor, Mr Mason. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to ask a question because a number of speakers have spoken about using um, the Civic Suite again, whether on a, on a replacement basis for public buildings currently being used or indeed as a backstop. I've heard various statements made that the, the building has been stripped, all of the benches and all of the um, tables have been taken out of the council chamber. I've had no one able to tell me what the position is. If we're going to have proposals put forward to reuse it again, then we need to know what, what condition it's in. So can, off, can an officer tell me, Chairman, please? Okay, next person to speak, Councillor Sharp. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'd just like to uh, express a view as to the scope of the socio-economic survey that, uh, an or analysis that uh, Councillor Newport recommended. I think it should uh, certainly include an analysis of the financials that is the cost of potential income of retaining the civic suite as against the total expenditures <coughs> and income that could be derived from retaining the current plan. But I think it should also look at the impact on the community and on the existing users of the facility and other potential users, because as, uh, as it has been remarked, it does have the facilities Although there may be some uh, issue on the condition of those facilities, they're there and they can be used. Thank you. Okay. Councillor, Mrs Rowe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it would be helpful if the monitoring officer could set out the options open to us under the Constitution. I'll let everybody speak and then uh, I'll ask the question. Sorry, I can see a hand. Sorry, Councillor Mrs Mason, sorry. Thank you, Chair. The residents have made their views well known. It is sad that the, div the divide between residents and the council remains so wide. The closure of the Mill Hall is, I understand, in abeyance. But the Civic Suite should be reconsidered and to reconsider that fully, I would appreciate it, and I'm sure Councillor Mason would, if someone could answer his question as to the state of the civic suite, because otherwise we are debating without full knowledge. So can someone please answer that question before the debate continues? Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, is there any other speakers? I'll come. Okay. I'll come back to you, Councillor Wood. Councillor Constable. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, can you can turn I, your mic just a little bit up so it picks you up? Can I just uh, remind members, although Braley is one of the largest towns in the area, it's not the centre of Rochford District Council. Uh, Rochford 
town is actually more central to Rochford. It's also served by um, a railway station that is adjacent to it and several bus routes, and it is a more central point in the area, whereas Rayleigh isn't. And 2,000 people on a petition when we've got over 80,000 people in the district isn't a good representation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wooten, did you want to come back when you when you speak at the end of the debate? Okay. Okay, Councillor Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to point out that Rayleigh has a railway station, also has the main bus routes into Rayleigh, and it's Rayleigh residence where the Mill Hall is, and not in Rochford. Thank you. And it's central to Rayleigh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Myers. Short little speech, really. Um, I was elected in May 2001 and have yet to see the inside of the council chamber. But every person I've spoken to has said it is not fit for purpose. It's too small, too dark. It's not... You can't get, if everybody turns up, nobody can get into the building. Sentiment has to go by the side and economics must take over. And if it needs to be sold because it's no good, then it has to go. That's my point, Chairman. Okay. Councillor Hoy. Councillor Hoy. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, just briefly, I believe there was a motion put forward and seconded. If that was the case, can that be repeated, please? Um, and, and I'll just leave that there. I just want to know what the motion is, if there was one put forward. There was, and uh, we'll come to that in a second or two. Does anybody else wish to speak? A motion, was, can I, I didn't hear the motion clearly, if it was put forward. I may have a question if I understood what the motion was. Thank you. The motion was that no further action should be taken. It's a, a bit of an open motion, isn't it? But what does that mean? That we... It's, no further action is taken in relation to the petition or to the civic suite or the mill hall. Okay. I'll let the officer just answer those couple yeah, of questions. Thanks, I just want to understand the motion. Chairman, thank you. It assists. Um, under um, uh, the cons Council's constitution, um, the response to petitions following debate uh, has a finite number of potential options. Um, option uh, four is uh, to take the action, sorry, number one is to take the action requested in the petition as drafted. Option two is not taking the action requested for reasons put forward in the debate. Uh, option three is commissioning further investigation into the matter, or option four, deciding whether to make recommendations where the matter falls to the executive to make the final decision. So, members, the last option there does not apply because this is a meeting of full council and the decision is for you. For you. So, therefore, the op three options are to do what is requested by the petitioner, not to take any further action or to commission further investigation. Those are the options, members. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I've got Time for one more speaker before we sum up. No one seems to okay. to Councillor Wooten, if you'd like to sum up on there, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Tellis for the presentation of the uh, uh, petition this evening uh, and for his patience in presenting it to us. Um, I uh, would like to point out that he referred to the fact that there are 2,024 signatures and I have absolutely no doubt very genuine in their wishes and the wording of this motion. Uh, but there are 85,000 residents of this district, uh, 50,000 or so live in the Rady, immediate Rady area. Um, I have to say, and again I respect the fact it's a bit of a dated motion, but there have been two public consultations, one with the asset delivery program itself and one with the planning proposals. So it has been out to public consultation. Uh, there was never ever any intent, intention to sell the Mill Hall. Um, that, 
the plan, the original plan, which there's been a lot of ground covered since, was to actually provide Rayleigh with a brand new community centre, albeit on a different footprint. I realise that is now history, and I am committed to providing a fine uh, community centre uh, in, uh, in Rayleigh in a refurbished mill hall for the reasons I've set out at Executive um, a month or so ago. Uh, in terms of the Civic Suite Chairman, um, I think as an obligation as a council, we have to look at redundant and surplus buildings. And it is no longer needed. Um, it is as simple as that. And in any good housekeeper's uh, purse, we have to look at the pennies. Uh, the simple fact is the Civic Suite is not functional. Um, I'm not quite sure where the comfy seats come from because I've never sat on a comfy seat there. Uh, they are pretty impressive to look at, but certainly not particularly comfortable uh, to uh, sit on for too long. Um, I've had the benefit of looking at the Constitution, and uh, that is why, Chairman, I come to the conclusion that, uh, with the greatest of respect to Mr Tellis and the uh, signatures on the uh, petition, I come to the conclusion that, in practical terms, on the wording of this motion, uh, there and is you, no further Councillor action. Councillor Wharton, if you would sum up now, please. Thank you very much indeed, up. Chairman. I've said all I wish to say. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Members, just before I get Councillor Webb to... Um, uh, restate his motion. Can you just ask the question on that was asked about the furniture, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, my understanding is that the because the build, building is vacant, um, office furniture, so desks and chairs, and, and re, which would be used by offices, has been removed, um, and that would be perfectly normal um, for uh, insurance purposes and for fire risk purposes. Um, but the chamber remains intact. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Webb, can you re represent your motion, please? Thank you, Chairman. I have listened closely to the debate tonight, and clearly we have no intention of selling the Mill Hall. In fact, we have agreed to reopen it, and not just in the daytime, but during the evening and weekends as well. Where the Civic Suite is concerned, a decision will be made in accordance with due process at a later date at full council, where a stop-go decision will be taken. Therefore, these reasons, I propose that no further action is taken. Thank you. Mr Tellis, uh, you have the opportunity to have one minute to say anything further, if you so wish. Thank you. A very interesting debate. Um, I would emphasise, whilst there were... 2024 signatures on this particular petition your own consultation your own engagement consultation actually showed that almost 90 percent of those respondents wanted to save the civic suite almost 90 percent so really what you're saying is our consultation went out we're ignoring 90 percent of the respondents so i'm quite disappointed by that um, I note what your, your, your the motion, and uh, also um, Councillor Newport was seeking to do a motion. I would hope that that would still be uh, available to the council uh, should, uh, should the opportunity arise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, we have a motion moved by Councillor Webb and seconded by Councillor Wooten. We will now vote on the motion. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, if you could speak clearly when Sonia calls your name, please. Councillor Mrs. Belton. Four. Councillor Mrs. Butcher. Four. Councillor Mr. Carter. Four. Councillor Mrs. Carter. Against. Councillor Constable. Four. Councillor Cripps. Okay. 
next. Councillor Refty. <laughs> Councillor Eaves. Against. Councillor Foster. For. Councillor Mrs. Gadsden. For. Councillor Hoy. Against. Councillor Lamborn. Against. Councillor Mrs. Mason. Against. Councillor Mr. Mason. Against. Councillor Mrs. McPherson. For. Councillor Milne. For. Councillor Myers. For. Councillor Mr. Newport. Against. Councillor Lisa Newport. Against. Councillor Mrs. Rowe. For. Councillor Sharp. Against. Councillor Mrs. Shaw. For. Councillor Mrs. Squires Coleman. Against. Councillor Spelling. For. Councillor Stanley. Against. Councillor Steptoe. Councillor Ward. For. Councillor Webb. For. Councillor Wilkinson. Against. Councillor Wilson. Will, William, sorry. For. Councillor Mr. Wilson. Against. Councillor Mrs. Wilson. Against. Councillor Wotton. Members, that is 18 for the motion, 15 against the motion, so the motion is <coughs> carried. Mr Tellis, you will receive a written copy of the Council's response to your petition and a copy will also be uploaded on the council's website. Mr Tellis and any other members of the public, you're more than welcome to stay for the remaining of the, of the business, but if you <coughs> like to leave, please do so through the door to my right and make your way to the car park. I'd like to thank Mr Tellis for coming forward and bringing the petition and taking the opportunity to stand and speak. Thank you, members. That concludes that item of business. I will now turn to item six of the agenda. Members, item six, the appointment of directors to the Council, council Local Authority Trading Companies. The, the report will be presented by the Council Strategic De Director, Angela Hutchins. Thank you, members. Um, the report before you re uh, arises for appointment of uh, the Council's local authority <coughs> trading companies. The Council is the shareholder of uh, a number of local authority trading companies in accordance with the relevant legislation. Um, the right, therefore, to appoint directors to those, counts, to those companies um, lies with Council, and therefore, members, you're asked to make the recommendations that are set out in paragraph 12. Thank you. Do we have any speakers on this item? Councillor Hoy. Yes, um, it's a, a question. I was uh, originally involved in the setting up of the Black Coes some years ago, and the advice we, we received then was that councillors wouldn't normally be appointed as, as directors to these companies. Can I just ask why that advice has now changed? Thank you. I assume it's changed. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hoy. Um, in relation to the um, Rochford North Limited, um, that is a joint venture company with a, uh, another um, uh, entity. As a consequence of the Articles of Association of that company, um, it's that, as it says in paragraph 6.3, no resolution can be passed unless it's agreed by at least one council appointed director. The control, therefore, of the council in respect of that joint venture should properly sit with a council under those very particular circumstances. Okay. Question. It was, or maybe I didn't word the question very well. Sit. 
Effectively, I'm saying, why are we appointing a councillor? Because the vice president previously has been not to. So the previous, uh, so all the other local authority trading companies, the council is 100% shareholder, and therefore the um, role of the share, uh, council is as shareholder rather than as director of the company. In relation to the joint venture, the, the council itself is also uh, is therefore not the sole shareholder, and under the rules of the uh, local authority trading company, is actually a minority shareholder. Therefore, it's important for the council to have representation at board level, and that's why a councillor is appointed as a director. Anybody else wish to speak? Councillor Newport. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it might have been of uh, some benefit to explain exactly what these uh, limited companies are for, because I, for one, don't know what the Green Gateway Trade and Development uh, Limited Company actually does. And it might have been beneficial for newer members. Could um, officers briefly explain, please? Thank you, Councillor Newport. Um, you may remember, it certainly pre it's a decision of this council which predates me, that the council have uh, set up a group of limited uh, local authority trading companies, of which Green Gateway Trading Limited is the parent company or the holding company. Uh, Green Gateway Trading GM Limited and Green Gateway Trading Development Limited are subsidiaries of that holding company. So the shareholder for each of those is in fact the hold company and Green Gateway Trading Limited. The idea behind setting up those um, uh, trading companies in the first instance was to allow the council the opportunity to deliver its um, grounds maintenance contracts, um, both uh, as, a, as a, an arm's length uh, company, but also to other public sector bodies. Um, and for the um, trading development company at the time was around the p potential for the council to undertake um, housing development under its own steam, given that the council no longer has a housing revenue account. The only way that um, the council can legitimately build houses is through an arm's length uh, local authority trading company. The circumstances are such, however, that Green Gateway Trading Development Limited has never traded and remains um, therefore uh, untrading. Uh, Green Gateway Trading Limited exists purely, as I say, as a holding company and has, conducts no business on its own terms. And Green Gateway Trading GM Limited, the grounds maintenance contract, came to uh, a cease to trade when the service was brought back in-house in December of last year. The uh, Norse uh, Joint Venture Company is a consequence of the uh, agreement by this council to enter into a joint venture with Norse Commercial Services Limited. And the joint venture company between those two between that organisation and the council is the delivery vehicle for the council's waste um, contract. Councillor Newport. Newport, did you want to come back? Yes, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Sorry, I think I missed a bit about. Well, maybe I didn't on the development. But since these are dormant companies, wouldn't it just be easier to wind them up? Thank you, Councillor Newport. Um, that is uh, certainly an option. <laughs> Uh, winding up companies have, is a uh, somewhat complicated um, process when the council is a shareholder. It's intended that a report will be brought back to the council in the autumn in order to uh, give the council the option to wind up companies which are uh, no longer trading. Um, however, the council may decide to, uh, to, to keep them and therefore preserve the name because there are pros and cons associated with winding up the, uh, the companies, um, particularly a company which has only recently ceased to um, operate. Um, this decision has been brought forward simply because of the vacancies arising through the departure of myself and other colleagues from the, uh, from the council. Thank you. Councillor Eves. I do understand what um, Angela has just brought to us, but uh, a member's liquidation isn't that complicated. I don't understand why we're going through all the uh, rigmarole of keeping these companies going when they have no purpose. And there is no seeming reason for them, nothing coming up as far as I can see, on any agenda anywhere. It just seems completely pointless. So thank you, Councillor Ease. With respect, I think that is a decision for Council to make in the fullness of time. Um, the future use of the trading companies or not is a matter for the Council to, be, to, to decide. The winding up is necessary because when a com company has been uh, in operation, at least six months needs to um, pass before the company can um, be legitimately wound up. Uh, there are insurance um, uh, reasons for keeping the um, company, for winding the companies up, but equally 
uh, if a company is wound up, then it loses its name and the council loses its proprietary interest in intellectual property in the name Green Gateway Trading. And so that's a decision for council which will be brought back in the autumn. Okay. Councillor Sharp, uh, when you indicate, can you please make sure it's nice and positive? We weren't sure if you were indicating or not. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to ask whether the directorship is a paid position. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sharp. No, they are not. Thank you. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I fully understand the position as laid down in this document. It's purely a case, and it's very common, to make companies which have a trademark and are trading and have traded to make them dormant and, that, and, and then at a later time, if the opportunity arises, they can be reactivated quite easily. So I fully agree with what has been done thus far. Thank you, Chairman. Just checking, anybody else? Nobody is indicating, okay, Chairman. Thank you. Members, there are three recommendations set out in paragraph 12.1 of the report on pages 6.2 and 6.3. I'll remove them from the chair. Uh, I'll read them through. To appoint Marcus Hotton as Director of Green Gateway Trading Limited. Two, to appoint Marcus Hotton as Director of Green Gateway Trading Development, in brackets, Limited. Three, to appoint Councillor David Sperring and, Count and Steve Summers as Directors of the Rochford Norse Limited. Do, Do I have a second? Yeah, Councillor Woodson. Okay. Members, are you happy for me to take the three recommendations on block? I will assume agreement unless you raise your hand. Okay, thank you. So, members, those in favour, please indicate. Please lower your hand. Those against? Okay. Are there any abstentions? Members, that is. That's 34 against zero and three abstentions. Members, that motion is carried. Members, item seven of the agenda, appointment of the Joint Strategic Directors. Uh, the report will be presented by the Council Strategic Director, Angela Hutchins. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is a report to confirm the appointment of Tier 2 Strategic Directors for the Brentwood Borough Council and Rochford District Council 1 team. These are joint appointments which will serve both councils in accordance with the um, um, one team transformation program. Uh, a report in identical terms will go to the Brentwood Borough Council full council evening, tomorrow evening. Um, statutory guidance under section 40 of the Localism Act 2011 requires that full council or some other agreed formal meeting of members should be offered the opportunity to approve salary packages over £100,000. Um, and members, therefore, I invite you to approve the recommendations set out in paragraph 9. Members, uh, there is a confidential appendix to this report. If you need to refer to this or ask a question on this, can you please raise your hand now, as it will be necessary to exclude the press and the public first. Nobody's indicating, Chair. Okay, thank you. Does anybody wish to speak on this? Councillor Hoy. Councillor Hoy. 
Thank you, Chairman. Item 8 on page 7.3. Apparently, we've not completed any quality impact assessment. There's no relevant decision is being taken. I would beg to disagree, as I do quite often with this at uh, this point in our agenda. Um, I, would, I would hope a relevant decision is being made. We're appointing people to director roles. Surely within the recruitment process, we made sure that the, this was fair under the Equality and Diversity Act. Can you confirm that was the case? If, it, if we are, it should at least be mentioned in point A. I think we had this discussion at the last meeting where we're failing to use this part of the agenda properly. We're not stating how we are looking at equality and diversity implications. We're just taking it as read that we've done it somewhere within our policies. We should be stating the policies where this is, this is looked at when we are doing these appointments like these. And it's not done. Can you confirm that has been done, please? Do you wish to come on? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. Yes, I can confirm that an equality impact assessment was undertaken as part of the restructure process. The, um, in, in terms of this report, the, dis, the equal, equality impact assessment relates to the decision that's being taken, and the decision, therefore, is to appoint, uh, sorry, is to confirm the appointment, the appointment having already been made by the relevant uh, committee. So, um, so that is why there is no relevant decision for the purposes of the EQIA, but I can, of course, confirm that the appointments were undertaken in accordance with all HR um, policies for both councils, uh, and indeed in the light of the pay policy statement approved by this council in June of this year. Okay, uh, next on my list is Councillor Mrs Mason. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to... Councillor Mrs Mason, can you move the mic just a little closer, please? I can indeed. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm going to move to a query on the recommendation. You'll be pleased, I'm sure, to hear that I've got no um, issue with recommendation one, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, most of us here will support that. However, um, recommendation two creates a problem. Previous council decision, very clearly, was that any changes to the constitution were checked by the standards committee before changes were implemented, even when they were minor changes of a name change. The reasons for these were, amongst other things, but, but basically were twofold. One was to prevent errors, and secondly, to add member involvement to a critical council document. Can I ask why and what are the reasons that we were departing from a previous council decision? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mrs Mason. I'm not aware of that previous decision, and certainly this recommendation has appeared in uh, several reports um, uh, in, in identical terms. Um, so it's not a, it's not a new recommendation. Um, I hear what you say in relation to uh, the ability of this council to ask for um, uh, changes to be checked by the uh, Standards Committee. It's a fact that in the Constitution, changes um, to the Constitution lie with full council. So it is a matter for full council to decide whether to delegate those, as is suggested by a second recommendation to the monitoring officer in consultation with the portfolio holder for governance, or to indeed delegate them to another body. Um, and uh, members, uh, that is of course a matter for you. Thank you. Mr Chairman, yeah, I, I can only apologise that I didn't pick up this error before, but, um, but I have picked it up. And the reason that decision was made by the Council was because a change to the Constitution was effected. I was hoping not to have to say this in full Council, but because a change to the Constitution was implemented, which was impossible for members to actually carry out. And it took six months for that to be corrected. And that's why that change was made. I'm not sure that it's ever been enacted because I'm not on the Sanders Committee and haven't been recently. But it is a matter of concern that there should be some sort of backstop to any changes. Thank you. Thank you. Right, next on my list is Councillor Mrs Shaw. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, and then we go to Councillor Newport. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a point of clarification. On um, page 7.2, uh, it's, it's the first line on that page. 
Emily Eel appointed on the 14th of July, who will be employed on the blank council's establishment. Could uh, officers clarify whose establishment she'll be employed on, please? Thank you, Councillor Newport. It isn't a blank, it's just the line spacing of the formatting. It reads, will be employed on the council's establishment, i.e. Rochford District Council. Thank you. Any other speakers? Nobody else is indicating. Okay. Oh, uh, oh. No, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Mrs Wilson. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Councillor Mrs Wilson, can you just turn the mic so it points up towards you? Is That's that it. better? Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to go back to the point of the uh, equality and diversity um, impact assessments made by my colleague, uh, Councillor Hoy. Um, I have previous experience of these, and I've always found in the past that actually it's helpful to say when the consideration of the um, equality impact assessment um, was considered even if it was deemed not necessary or relevant to that point. I do think that that would be helpful going forward. That's it, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mrs Wilson. I think that point is noted and officers have made a note of that. Anybody? Councillor Efty. Thank you, Chairman. Just a quick... Councillor Efty, <laughs> can I? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Just a quick question. Where it says uh, Steve Summers and Ian Winslet will be uh, Brentwood Borough Council, is it uh, Emily Yard will be employed by Rochford, where it says the council? That's, that's correct, yep. Chair. Okay. Anybody else? Quickly. Okay. Members, there are two recommendations set out on page 7.4 of the report at paragraph 9.1. Recommendation one, to appoint the street director for the council and Brentwood Borough Council as set out in the confidential appendix. Excuse me. Two, that the monitor officer be given delegated authority in consultation with the portfolio holder for governance to make the required changes to the constitution to give effect to the recommendations in this report. I will move these recommendations from the chair. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Ward. Councillor Ward, thank you. Members, are you happy to take these recommendations on block? If you are not, please. Councillor Mrs. Mason. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll take them as separate items then. Okay, recommendation one, uh, to appoint the strategic director for the council and Brentwood Borough Council as set out in the confidential appendix. Those in favour? Please lower your hands. Those against? Okay. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Recommendation two, that the monitoring officer be given delegated authority in consultation with the portfolio holder for governance to make any required changes to the constitution to give effect to the recommendation in this report. Those in favour? Close your hands. Those against? And are there any abstentions? Okay. Um, item two, that's uh, 19 for, 13 against, and one abstention. That is carried.
Okay. Uh, members, moving on to item eight, reports from the executive and committees to the council. 8.81, report of the executive, advice service contracts 2022 to 2024. Councillor Williams, portfolio holder for communities and health, will introduce the report. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, uh, we're, we're being asked to agree the outcome of the advice services tender and award the advice services contract 22-24 to Citizens Advice South Essex. I shall refer to them as case here yeah, to save time for further on in my, my, my speech. Thank you. The, councils, the Council has for a number of years tendered and awarded an advisory services contract that our residents have come to rely on for free general support and independent advice. Case have, pro have proven over previous contracts to be a partner who have delivered a good level of service. Only last quarter, Case managed 814 inquiries, an increase of 150 inquiries in those demands for support were particularly in relation to debt, housing, money advice, employment, and relationship and family issues. Whilst the cost of living remains challenging for us all, it is more important than ever to support the ongoing provision of a free advisory and prevention service such as provided by CASE. Any, redu any reductions in provision would inevitably impact adversely on the wellbeing of our residents. Funding a general ad advice service provides support that can help residents prevent an escalation of health care and, and housing needs which in turn reduces the likelihood of them requiring more intensive and costly support in a crisis. This year's tender contract is for two years with the option for the council to extend the contract for a further one year. The value of this contract is 70,000 pounds per year. On, ev on evaluation the ten of the tender process, CASE met all the requirements of the specification and hence we are recommending that CASE should be awarded the advice services contract for years 22-24, in light of all the benefit it brings to our residents and council. Thank you. Members, anybody wish? Sir, Mr Newport. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wholeheartedly uh, support this. Um, the one thing that I would raise um, within this report, which I'm a little bit disappointed to read, is that the uh, council accommodation at Back Lane. Well, residents that are hard up and uh, can't afford a train ticket or catch a bus, they need to get access to the service face-to-face -face in uh, Rayleigh. So I will ask the portfolio holder of IU Chair if we can uh, negotiate that with CASE to, and find them a space available in Rayleigh so residents can uh, access the service. I've referred three people to CASE this week so it's a really valuable service that and I'm sure with the cost of living crisis well underway it would be very valued thank you councillor Williams do you wish to respond to that yes, councillor um, oh, sorry I've got <laughs> Newport so I do apologize um, as far as I'm aware the civic suite is open the, the, the front desk is open and it's being used by by, by the citizens of Vice Bureau at the moment. Okay. 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 Uh, Council Hoy. At all, I've just got a few questions about how we monitor the service. I was interested to hear some figures from Council Williams just said about how many people have used it. I think it was the last quarter. It's, it's the, the microphones aren't perfect tonight, my ears. Um, can you? Can it be confirmed that we do set targets for case? Do we, how do we monitor them? Do we, is there a satisfaction survey done of, of customers who see it, see them? Um, how do we monitor the quality and diversity side of it in particular, which is in the report, I'm pleased to see. Um, how do we perform, how do they perform against targets in previous years? I, I just want to get an understanding of how much value our residents get out of the £70,000 
and what level of service they would have without it as well. I, d I just want to know how that's monitored. Is there, is there a system in place? Can uh, I be grateful for a response? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I would have to come back to you there and um, ca uh, come back with some more information for you. Yeah, I'd be grateful if... Can I go back to all councillors, please? Thank you. Thank you. OK. Councillor Efty. Thank you, Chairman. Just a quick question. I've um, been in this council a few years, and every year this comes around, which is a great service. But every year it's 70 grand. And I think 70 grand in the past has been the right sort of money, but with the cost of inflation, we're actually getting less for that £70,000. So I know it's too late for this year, but for next year, could we look in maybe putting this up a little bit with cost of inflation? Councillor Williams, did you want to respond to that at all? Not at this time, thank you, Chairman. A apart from the fact that as, um, this is the sum that's uh, be been asked for. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson. Chair. Um, Councillor Efty actually may have inadvertently answered my question because um, uh, I, I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly support this and I've no doubt that case provided an excellent service. The thing that concerns me from this report is that there was only one bid. Um, and I, I think it's quite unusual to get one bid, and I was going to ask why, and it might be because the, the, the level, the, the value of the contract, I don't know. Um, I, I'll leave that as a question, but it does concern me we're only getting one bid, and how can we measure properly the service we're providing for the residents? I know we can look at cases that are oh, they doing the right thing, but we don't know what else is out there, and I'm just a bit concerned we're only getting one bid, really. I don't know why we're only getting one bid. It's unusual. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Um, every year it goes out to t t tender, and, uh, and every year we only ever get one back in. So, um, like you, I would also wonder the same, but um, I'll make some inquiries and come back to you also. Thank you. Nobody else is on to Okay. Council. Anybody else? No? Okay. Okay, members, there's one recommendation which is set out at paragraph. 1.2 on page 8.11 of the report to agree the outcome of the advice service services tender and award the advice service services contract 2022 to 2024 to the citizens advice Essex case in brackets I'll move that from the chair if any can I have a second over that please I'm happy to second that chair Thank you. Members, all those in favour, please indicate. Thank you, members. That's unanimous. Members, item 8.2. Uh, the report of the Executive Asset Delivery Programme update. Councillor Webb, Portfolio holder, of, holder for Housing, Assets and Leisure, will introduce the report. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chairman. This item of business was referred by the Executive on 13th of July 2022 to Council with a recommendation on the Asset Delivery Programme update. The report to the Executive is attached in Appendix 1. I'm pleased to say that the executive unanimously agreed option three in the report, which was to reopen the Mill Hall, and further recommends to council that the additions to the 22-23 capital programme would support the costs associated with the refurbishment of the Mill Hall Arts and Events Centre to ensure a successful relaunch of the site in September 22. The two recommendations from, the exec from this executive meeting that needs to come before council tonight um, are outlined below on 8.21, and they are to agree the additions to the 22-23 capital programme of £6,250 for the compliance and essential maintenance works required to reopen the freight house to be funded from the general balance, and secondly, to agree additions to the 22-23 capital programme of £40,000 for compliance and essential maintenance works prior to the reopening of the Mill Arts and Events Centre. The costs will be funded from the general fund balances. Thank you. Are you moving those recommendations, Councillor Webb? I'm moving those, yes. Thank you, Chairman. Do Chairman. you have a seconder? Councilor. Okay. 
Councillor Mrs Shaw, thank you. Uh, right, we have first speaker on this, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor Webb, and um, I think we're all happy and um, pleased to see the Mill Hall opening again. Um, I've just got one question regarding the £40,000, if I may. Um, obviously, one thing we did discover within the partnership panel that we, well, we didn't know the cost of refurbishment of the building, it was a bit, and it's a very unknown quantity. So I wonder where the 40,000 figures come from, what you're hoping to achieve with that, and I know moving forward you're looking for bids of interest for community uh, groups to move in there. So how do you see the refurbishment programme moving forward? Because I would imagine the £40,000 not it. I wouldn't have thought that's anywhere near enough, but I'm just sort of guessing a bit, really. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Webb, do you want to respond to that? Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, I'm pleased that we are opening the Mill Hall as well. It's, it will be good for the town, good for the district. In terms of the breakdown of those figures, they're outlined in 16.7 within the report. That gives you the breakdown of the works that will be needed um, to reopen the Mill Hall in terms of the compliance and remedial works that will cost a total of £20,000. The maintenance um, for, the, for the opening, which will cost £70,000. And within that, the capital costs are part of that. If you wanted a further breakdown of those costs, then I would need to ask the Assistant Director, Matt Howard white for that information. Um, in terms of before we reopen in September, there will be a light touch refurb to the Mill Hall carried out, and then we'll be looking to continue further works to the Mill Hall in the to the Mill Hall in the fullness of time. Thank you. Okay. Any other quiet speakers? No, okay, thank you. Thank you. Members, there are two recommendations which I will take separately. Uh, as set out in paragraph 1.5 on page 8.2.1 of the report. Okay, first recommendation, as I say, I'll take these separately. To agree additions to the 2022-23 capital program of £6,250 for compliance and essential maintenance works required to the reopening of the freight house to be funded from general balances. Members, those in favour? Members, that's unanimous. Sorry, Councillor Lefty. Can you make a note of that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, item two, the additions to the 2022-23 capital programme of £40,000 for compliance and essential maintenance works prior to reopening the Mill Hall, the Mill Arts and Events Centre the costs will be funded from the general fund balances. Those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Okay. That's 32 for, none against, no abstentions. Councillor Hoy, what's that? It's four, yeah, you know, uh, you. within the Constitution, you understand. Councillor Newport. Um, you'll have to excuse my colleague, Councillor Stanley. He's had to leave. He's in a lot of agony, pain at the moment. So, could okay. please, could we just have a slight pause so I can just check on him? Yes, certainly. That's not Thank a problem. You. I'll, I'll suspend for five minutes. Thank you. Man it to the toilet. Yes. <laughs> it is quite warm in here, so if you wish to take your jackets off. Please feel, feel, feel free to do so. Um, it is quite warm. Um, and I do notice that a number of members have suddenly, suddenly found a raid of biscuits. Uh, if we were in our council chamber, that wouldn't be allowed. So, so I'm not going to mention it, but... <laughs> Actually, Chairman, some are on their double dose of biscuits. Yes, yeah, so we're, 
we're, we're not looking at anybody. Um, okay. Okay, members. Right, let's move on. Uh, item 8.3, uh, Review Committee Annual Report. Councillor Wilson, will Chairman of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, will introduce the report. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for inviting us to take our jackets off. Unfortunately, I only iron the front of my shirt. So I, <laughs> I think they call that a dicky, Councillor Wilson. <coughs> um, members, in front of you, you've got the annual report from, uh, for what was called previously the Review Committee. I'd like to thank all of the members of the committee uh, last year and the officers for their help and support during the year. Um, and also, with particular thanks to the Vice Chair, who does a lot of unseen work behind the scenes. So thank you. Um, last year, the committee was audited by the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny. We've implemented a number of those recommendations during the year, and we're, we're actually going to review ourselves on our progress later this year. Um, and we're obviously looking to make continual improvements. The committee is now looking much more at pre-scrutiny. So in the past, we've been quite a backward-looking committee, um, which actually doesn't really add much value. So we've now started to do pre-scrutiny, um, and the idea is that we influence um, policy and decisions, and we also provide robust assurance to members of the executive. We undertook our first pre-scrutiny in January, which was the Rochford District Council and Brentwood Borough Council partnership. And uh, as an exercise, I think personally that, that went very well. So thank you all the members. Um, so I commend the report to members, and I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Members, are there any questions you wish? Councillor Wooden. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity of congratulating Councillor Stuart Wilson um, under his stewardship for the way he has steered the review and latterly overview and scrutiny in this council. Um, I think together with his members, um, he has actually made that uh, a much more constructive and positive uh, process because it is right and proper that uh, decisions made by the administration are held to account and that is the due process for doing it. And equally, I think it is absolutely right that there is an opportunity for pre-scrutiny, which is a fairly new process for us here in Rochford. And I think already it is proving uh, major benefits. Um, so, well done. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your report. I will finish with a question. Um, there's a very shade of grey version in my uh, report here, uh, but where does the, uh, the report actually end up? Because it would be nice to think that uh, it receives wider publication, uh, possibly in some sort of better format than uh, uh, shades of grey in this report. I really do think that we actually ought to be, uh, um, you know, singing from the rooftops the good work that the uh, uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee is doing. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, I stand corrected by officers and Councillor Wilson, but I believe that will be uh, documented on the website. There's a colour version of it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, members, do you receive the annual report of the Review Committee 2021 stroke 22? Agreed, Chair. Thank you. Item 8.4, Treasury Management Annual Review 2021 stroke 22. Councillor Wilson, Chairman of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, will introduce the report. Chairman, the, um, the Treasury Management Annual Review 2021-22 report is a factual report, so it actually gives a statement of activities that were undertaken during that municipal year. Um, the Overview and Scrutiny Review Committee have reviewed the report and we've made no major uh, observations or recommendations, um, so I therefore commend the report to members and I'm less than happy to take questions on technical details. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? Councillor Hoy. Uh, just to ask why there are no equality and diversity implications on this report. There is no mention of it even. I can understand it might be none, 
but there's no mention of it, so it's not even being considered according to the report. Councillor Wilson, do you wish to comment on that, or shall we just, officers will note that and uh, take it away for the next report, obviously? Um, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I think it would be better to note it and take it away, but what I would ask is that we could put it in for next year's report, maybe. Thank you. Okay, officers will make a note of that, I'm sure. Any other questions? No, I'm not. Okay. Members, the contents of the Treasury Management Annual Report 2021-22, do you note it? Noted, Chair. Thank you, members. Item 8.5, the new Local Government Association Model Code of Conduct. The Chairman of the Standards Committee, Councillor McPherson, will introduce the report. Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Chairman. With the new Code of Conduct being written in the first person, it is hoped that councillors will take a stronger, more personal approach to ensure their actions meet those expected of a councillor. It aims to build on the seven principles of public life. Self selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. The new code now includes a definition of respect. Also, the term bullying is a new addition to the code. I will draw your attention to page 8.5.10 of the report. Respect means politeness and courtesy in behaviour, speech <coughs> and in the written word. Debate in having different views are all part of a healthy democracy. As a councillor, you can express, challenge, criticise and disagree with views, ideas, opinions and policies in a robust but civil matter, manner. Sorry. You should not, however, subject individuals, groups of people or organisations to personal attack. Bullying. The code refers to the Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service ACRE characteristics bullying as offensive, intimidating, malicious or insulting behaviour, an abuse or misuse of power through means that undermine, humiliate, denigrate or injure the recipient. Bullying might be a regular pattern of behaviour or one-off incident. It could happen face to face on social media, in emails or on phone calls. It can happen in the workplace or at work, social events, and may not always be obvious or noticed by others. Please remember it can even be indirect, such as simply liking a post on social media that is aimed at another person. So let us be honest. In politics, we may come from polar positions, but being respectful to each other can close divisions, enhance cooperation and build collaboration. Each and every councillor should be able to undertake their role without the fear of being bullied or ridiculed. In essence, through mutual politeness, respect and kindness, we will aid debate, listen better to each other and work more collaboratively to serve our residents. With this in mind, I put forward an additional recommendation at the standards meeting, which I'm pleased to say was seconded by Councillor Mike Wilkinson, leader of the Independent Party. It reads that leaders of all parties collectively pledge to uphold the new code of conduct within their parties and members. In addition, to encourage any candidates and campaigners to embrace the Nolan principles. I hope all members will support both recommendations. Together, we can create an environment which encourages others to want to give their time as a councillor. Thank you, members. Is there any questions, members? 
Councillor Hoy. Sorry, I'm not sure it's just um, restricted to questions, I thought. Um, I mean, clearly there's a number of councils around Essex at the moment, and Councillor Wilkin, um, sorry, Councillor Steptoe would be aware of this because this came up at Essex as well, that, of an attempt to try and get some, all, all councillors, councils to try and adopt the same um, model code of conduct. Um, I have no problem with this and I fully support that, no problem at all. I absolutely agree with everything um, Councillor McPherson just said. I've got no problem with that. But I, 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 I understand what you have said about the, the additional point one on there. I just feel that as a councillor, I'm, <coughs> I'm upholding the constitution anyway. I don't need a group leader to pledge it for me. I do it myself by being a councillor. And, and by standing as a councillor, I accept those, the, the model code. I, I, I just think it's superfluous. I think it's a nice statement to make, but I don't. I think everyone in this room, personally, are committed to uphold the code of conduct as it stands, and it won't stop me voting for it at all. But I just wanted to make that statement. I think we, we all, everyone here, agrees to, to the statement you've made, and I just think it's superfluous. But I'm happy to vote for it either way. Thank you. Councillor McPherson, do you wish to come back on it? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Hoy, all very good points and I'm so pleased that you support it. I want us to pledge, make that pledge, to strengthen the code of conduct, to make sure that we are all fully supportive of what it means. Most of us, I think all of us in this room are, but we can then take that forward and when new candidates come forward, we're setting a precedent of this is how we will behave. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Hyde, just come back. Well, just very briefly, um, it states that, count, that group leaders are collectively pledging. Are they gathering to physically pledge in a place on the first day of a council meeting, or is it a, a pledge that happens automatically once they're a group leader? I, I want to know the practicalities as well. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, um, uh, uh, the, the Vice Chair of Standards, um, Councillor uh, Mr Wilkinson, would you like to comment on this? <laughs> Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor McPherson. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand exactly where Councillor Hoy is uh, coming from because he's right. I mean, the, the whole purpose of this is actually this is written in the first person, and so we all have an, uh, um, a duty. The reason why I supported this in the Standards Committee, and the reason why I support this now, um, is, and it's a slightly moot point for, for the independent group, with only been two of us, but it's a, it's a completely different group, a completely different point for the size of the other um, groups within here, that actually as a group leader, you are responsible for the behaviour, uh, ultimately, of, of your members, um, and you should be encouraging good behaviour amongst your membership, and particularly if you're looking for new candidates, um, because as a group leader, you should be explaining to the candidates what's expected of them. Um, and I think really well, what, what we were trying to say was that, you know, rather than all 39 members standing in a big parade somewhere saying, yeah, we support this, you know, the four group leaders, only four of us, and we say, yes, on behalf of our groups, yes, we, we pledge this and we will uphold them because ultimately, and I think I'm correct in saying this, is if, if a standards complaint is upheld um, and um, it, it can be, I think, that it comes back to a group leader to deal with it. And so you have to have some degree of sort of authority over your group members uh, in that sense. Like I said, it's a moot point with my group because it's only myself and my father-in-law, so we're not going to do that. But I think for the slightly larger groups in here, it might be more relevant. But that's where we're coming from. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Thank you, Chairman. I've listened to the points that have been made. And actually, the more I've listened to the points, the more I think the uh, recommendation there uh, or the adoption isn't the right wording um, because it's not actually about being encouraged it's about being required so I would personally replace the word with encouraged to required and then that strengthens uh, the uh, the statement others may have different wording and then when I start looking at the point that councillor Hoy made councillor Wilkinson I agree that group leaders do have a responsibility to maintain discipline, order, respect, all the standards of courtesy that we would expect. But actually, group leaders can't enforce it. Uh, so there has to be some balance where 
Um, group leaders certainly have a responsibility, totally support. But actually, I think there needs to be a pledge by members as well in there. Uh, and I can't think immediately of the wording offhand, but actually I think there should be a strengthening of the point rather than a dilution of it. Uh, and as I'm reading it, I'm sort of thinking it, it's a bit, it's well intended, no, in no way critical, but I would like to see a strengthening of it um, and uh, would welcome further debate on it uh, if others might have some suitable wording. Um, I think in public life now, public life can at times be uh, a bit of a thankless task um, because I think some standards outside of the 39 councillors are very much wanting but we do have control within our own uh, setup uh, what people outside uh, our life do I'm afraid we have to manage uh, but I think it's all about dignity respect making our points uh, but respecting the points that are made uh, with that I'll sit down chairman and uh, throw it open thank you Catherine um, can I just ask a question uh, of, of Sonia here? When we are elected as councillors, we are we are asked to sign a book. Is that what that's, that's what we sign, isn't it? To a pledge to uphold. Le legally, there is no requirement to uh, to to actually. Um, sorry. <coughs> legally, there is no requirement to uh, to to actually pledge to uh, to uphold the uh, the code of conduct when you when you become a new councillor however we do ask our members to uh, when they when they sign the book they they, they they all declare that they will sort of uphold the uh, the, the, the model code of conduct conduct that is something that uh, that we have done for, for many year, years here at Rochester district council does that cover your point councillor Wooden? well it does chairman to an extent there's an awful lot of things in life that aren't actually illegal, but it's about considerateness, courtesy. Um, and I don't think we need a law to understand what good courtesy and standards are. Uh, so I take the point uh, from the uh, Principal Democratic Services Officer, uh, understand that, but I still think it's about setting a standard um, and it's a little bit like, dare I say, planning, where we have standards on certain things that we uh, would like to see in planning in the district, which aren't necessarily set out in the national codes. I think it's about uh, actually us setting ourselves apart and proving that Rochford District Council is just a cut above the rest. Thank you. Councillor Hoy. Sonia, thank you. Okay. Councillor Mrs. Mason. Thank you. I must admit, I, I think I agree with Councillor Wootton that we, we're saying the first person, then we're putting it in the third person. And this reads that the group leaders, well, I've got no problem with pledging to do my best, but it, it takes it away from the individual. So, um, whilst I'm quite happy to agree to it, I do think a better or a different wording that is more aimed at the individual might be helpful. So I don't know if anyone wants to, like Councillor Wooten, I've got no words tonight. But the other thing that was quite interesting, Sonia, Sonia has said that um, when we sign our acceptance of office, we also sign the Code of Conduct. But when we sign the acceptance of office, we're usually in a very heady state, shall we say. <laughs> we're, we're not actually reading it. We're, we're getting a book thrust in front of us. Oh gosh, we've won. And we're signing it. How many of us, and, and I hold my hand up, I've never read it. How many of, of us read it? So can I just make a simple proposal that might help that? that after the election, when we've all calmed down a little bit, that we get a copy of what we've signed. A paper copy, I think, would be good as well, because I know what happens with electronic copies. They're not read either. Um, so that people... Oh, I don't mind it being electronic, honestly, but I, personally I prefer paper. But so that, that members, especially new members, have the opportunity to read what they've signed away from the, the um, very emotive time of an election day. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone... If that C that. Councillor McPherson would like to come back on that. I'll bring you in in a second, Councillor Wilton. I've got a couple of other speakers first. 
Thank you. Um, first of all, um, Council Mrs. Nathan, there is a copy of what you sign in everybody's pack that they're given on the night of the election that they take home. Um, so um, the copy is in there. Um, I've listened to what both yourself and Councillor Wotton have said. And here's some slightly amended wording. If anybody would agree to this. That all members pledge to uphold the new code of conduct and group leaders pledge that any potential local candidates and campaigners be required to act in accordance with the Nolan principles. If everybody's happy with that, I'm quite happy to um, amend the second recommendation. Do I need a second? Okay. Councillor McPherson, yeah. are you proposing that? Uh, I'm proposing that. Okay. I think. Sorry. Well, you won't hear it again, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that all members pledge to uphold the new code of conduct and group leaders pledge that any potential local candidates and campaigners be required to act in accordance with the Nolan principles. Okay. Do you have a seconder for that? Yes. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, members, I have got other speakers on the original uh, motion, but obviously we now need to speak to the amendment. Um, does anybody else want to speak on the amendment? Councillor Hoy. Um, no, we need to vote on the amendment. Thank you. Yeah, but he's speaking to the amendment. No, this is... I'm being advised, Councillor Hoyer, that we need to vote first. So on I'll what? come back to you in a second. Okay, what are we voting on? Okay, I will get the proposal to read it again so you know exactly. <laughs> Councillor Hoy, um, we now have to vote as I've proposed an amendment to my recommendation myself, which is that all members pledge to uphold the new code of conduct and group leaders pledge that any potential local candidates and campaigners be required to act in accordance with the Nolan principles. That has been seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Members, that uh, amendment is before you. Those who... Yeah, I just can speak in the amendments, yeah. Um, Vote on it. I'm being advised we've got to vote on it to be able to debate it. So, no, that's the wrong way around. No. And there will be another vote at the end of this. So, uh, members, those in favour of the amendment, please show with your hand. I can't vote because this is ridiculous. Those against? Any abstentions? for a point of clarification it's normal when we have a, a a motion and a seconder to allow debate before a vote to vote on it before it's even debated it seems a little bit back to front to me and certainly okay. not what we would normally do so can someone clarify that can thank you, you. That you're you're vote you're not you're not voting to accept this amendment to the motion but you're actually voting that you're happy to proceed with debate on it we'll debate it and then there will be a vote okay 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 right what i have is 22 for none against and 10 abstentions um members if you could just bear with me a moment i need to just clarify with officers on going forward. Bear with me just a moment, members. Okay. Members, is there anybody who wishes to speak to the amendment? Councillor Mr Hoy. Councillor Mr Hoy. Sorry, very weird. Um, 
the I'm quite contrary, as you know. If I'm told to do something, I don't quite like doing it, even though I'd do it anyway. Um, can it be confirmed that when we, or if we are elected to be a councillor, the signing of our acceptance of the of the form where we say we accept the code of, con code of conduct, that is effectively what we're talking about in this motion. So this is the pledge. It's not a separate pledge, is it? And if there is a pledge and we have to go and hold our hand up and pledge, what are the repercussions if we refuse to pledge? Um, this is also, and I've got no problem with this for, at all, you know, code of conduct, no problem at all. And I do my very best to uphold it at all times. But however, this is, this is not, this is excluding for instance, the Labour Party, who don't have a group leader but who campaign and stand for elections, they're not doing the pledge. So it's a bit of an uneven playing field on, on that side as well. But I just want an answer to those questions, please. Councillor McPherson is going to come back on that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hoy, it's a pledge. So by voting on it tonight, you are pledging that you will abide by that. Um, our officer may clarify anything else. This is just asking for support. I honestly, hand on heart, did not think that this would be that difficult to receive support for strengthening our code of conduct. Thank you. Um, and can I just say, there is no comeback. Um, if you break that pledge, as we know with standards, we know the process. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else wish to... Questions to the, I think I saw some nodding, but I don't remember getting an answer, answer actually. But it, the signing of the form is effectively the pledge. Is that correct? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hoy, to confirm at the point at which uh, a member signs the Office of Acceptance, they are accepting to be a councillor and to abide by the Code of Conduct and the Constitution of this Council. Um, this recommendation is using pledge as a verb rather than a noun, so it is not making a pledge in a hand on a Bible kind of a pledge, but it's more about a, 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 a statement um, by this council that is essentially delivered by uh, uh, passing this resolution. That's what's proposed. Councillor Newport. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I understand um, Councillor um, McPherson's frustration with this uh, pledge, but I do have an issue with it because we, it, within our constitution of our local party, we already set out how our campaigners and candidates should behave. But for group leaders to have to come along and enforce this or tell them this, it doesn't work for me because, unfortunately, I wholeheartedly support it. I, I really do. But I don't have dealings with candidates and campaigners in across my group, across my party, not my council. In my council group, I do, but in my party, I don't. It's totally separate for me because, and I think you're. I think you'll even find this yourself. You may have candidates. They go for a vetting process, but it, I can stand here and explain the process, but some cam campaigners and candidates in Rochford, I may never see them. It's just the way it works in politics. But I wholeheartedly support this, and obviously, if there was an issue, I would do my very best to resolve that, and, to, uh, and to, there would be recourse, but that would be within our local party constitution and how we select members. So I'm fully supportive of it and, and, and I, I am, but there, the wording of it presents the issue because I'm happy to pledge, but I, I already know that I could easily break that pledge because I'm not in control of really what's going on with the candidates and, and um, campaigners. So. I think that wording does need working on. Thank you. Councillor Wooden. Councillor Wooden. Chairman, thank you. <coughs> well, 
my perspective, I think we're doing what we do rather well in this chamber from time to time, and that is get a little bit confused with procedure, uh, an intent, a wish, a desire to do something which improves something better. Um, I, I'm not quite sure who is speaking to the current motion or the original motion. Um, what I am very clear on is a, a unanimous desire to strengthen and uphold standards. And what bothers me is, coming back to what we do rather well in this chamber from time to time, is try and on the hoof come up with some words. I have absolutely no problem personally with the words that Councillor McPherson has come up with. Um, but I would suggest that a sensible way forward could be to defer this item, uh, bring back some new uh, wording when the um, Standards Committee have actually been able to collectively take on board the feelings and the perceptions uh, of this chamber tonight rather than knee-jerk and start putting words together. Uh, we have tried to do that in the past. It doesn't work. It's well-intentioned, uh, but I just think we could do a lot better, Chairman. Okay. What did you say? Okay. Is Councillor Mrs. Mason. Mrs. Mason. Thank you. I wholeheartedly endorse what Councillor Woodson said. I don't think any of us have got any difficulty in the strengthening, and, and I take on the board Councillor McPherson's concern. We're not trying to weaken it. What we're trying to make it is workable. And we all want to encourage the highest standards in public life. But I, I endorse exactly what Councillor Woodson said. We, we can't do that on the hoof. We've had a long debate over words, and whilst we all have the same aim, we're not achieving that aim. So I agree that it should be deferred, that wording could go back, and perhaps even come with three alternatives so we can vote on alternatives. I don't know. It's up to the Standards Committee to sort that out, but I don't think it's this detail of debate is very constructive tonight we're not getting anywhere and we do need we do need to resolve this so i would certainly second if we need a seconder councillor Orton's motion to defer thank you councillor mcpherson would like to come back on that i agree wholeheartedly um councillor mrs mason um there has been some <coughs> awkward debate on this um however I think the papers for this evening came out well in advance, which would have given a little bit of time for people to come forward with wording, rather than dismiss this. Yes, we could defer it, but I'll be passionate enough to do something about this council and strengthen it and come up with a resolution this evening. I'll leave that with you, members. Thank you. Members, I, I've listened to the debate here. Uh, perhaps I can come up with a suggestion. Um, certainly the Chairman of the Standards Committee, uh, and I'm assuming that most of the committee members will be here this evening, will have taken on board what has been said. Can I suggest that other, other than deferment, which technically has not been moved yet, that we accept the recommendations but with the caveat that the that it goes back to the Standards Committee for further debate. Can I offer that as a suggestion? How would members feel on that? Okay. Councillor Efty. Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to second that, if you want to make that motion. Members, I'm getting advice here. We've got, already got an, uh, an amendment. Um, do mem can members uh, indicate if they're happy to accept that amendment? Thank you. Thank you. How done? How done? We've already done that. All right. We need to vote on this one. Vote on what? We need to vote on the amendment to the motion, which, which uh, Councillor McPherson.
getting confused about anybody else. And I would like um, a... But is Councillor Mac Mac Macpherson's motion accepted? Members, sorry, I'm getting, getting advice here. Um, members, uh, Councillor McPherson will read the amendment and then we'll take a vote on that amendment. Councillor McPherson, if you'd like to read that, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, amended to include um, uh, the, or strengthen it, as was recommended by Councillor Wootton and Councillor Mrs Mason. It now reads that all members pledge to uphold the new code of conduct and group leaders pledge that any potential local candidates and campaigners be required to act in accordance with the Nolan principles. And Chairman, may I um, ask for a recorded vote if anybody will stand with me? Thank you. Is that sufficient? Members, that will now, now be a recorded vote. Point of order, but I've heard three um, proposals seconded. I'm not quite sure which one of the... The, the only one we can through. take at the moment was the first one, which Councillor McPherson has just read out. Councillor Foster, do you need it read to... Before we go to the vote, you're happy with it? Right, okay. Sonia, if you can do the recorded vote, please. Councillor Mrs. Bolton. Councillor Mrs. Butcher. Councillor Mr. Carter. Councillor Mrs. Carter. Councillor Constable. <laughs> Councillor Cripps. <laughs> Councillor Efty. <laughs> Councillor Eaves. <laughs> Councillor Foster. <laughs> Councillor Mrs. Gadsden. <laughs> Councillor Hoy. <laughs> Councillor Lamborn. <laughs> Councillor Mrs. Mason. <coughs> Councillor Mr. Mason. Councillor Mrs. McPherson. Councillor Milne. Councillor Myers. Councillor Mr. Newport. <coughs> Councillor Lisa Newport. Councillor Mrs. Rowe. Councillor Sharp. Abstained. Councillor Mrs. Shaw. Four. Councillor Mrs. Squires Coleman. Councillor Sperring. Four. Councillor Stepto. Four. Councillor Ward. Four. Councillor Webb. Four. Councillor Wilkinson. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Mr. Wilson. Four. Councillor Mrs. Wilson. Um, I choose not to vote, thank you. Mm. Councillor Wootton. Four. Members, that's 24 and 12 abstentions. Members, if you could just bear with me a second. So that's replaced that, so it's done. We now move on to the second recommendation, uh, which I'll read out, and I'll move from the, from the chair, that the LGA model code of conduct be adopted with the effect from the 1st of August 2022. Do I have a seconder for that? Yes, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Anybody wish to comment on that? Okay, members, I will go straight to the vote on that, as nobody's indicated. Those in favour? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, members. That's unanimous. Okay, member, members, moving on to agenda item nine, to note the minutes of the executive and committee meetings held between period 2nd of February to the 13th of July, 2022. Are these noted, members? Noted, Chairman. Thank you. Agenda item 10. Okay, agenda item 10. Business from the last... Or if I may, um, with relation to amendments of notices, um, part 4, 15.6, can we just confirm for the, for the purpose of procedure that we're not going to fall foul of something in the future because we've had one vote on the amendment. My understanding of the Constitution is at that point it then becomes a substantive motion, which we did not then do a second vote on. So okay. I just question whether we should be moving forward. At Let this me time. just clarify that with officers, members. Okay, members, I stand corrected. Um, my apologies. Um, okay. Right, so we'll just go back to... Uh, hang on, just get my notes here. Uh, item 8.5, um, recommendation 1 has now been amended to, and Councillor McPherson, will you read it out again, please? That all members are pledged to uphold the new code of conduct and group leaders pledge that any potential local candidates and campaigners be required to act in accordance with the Nolan principles. Members, that is now the substantive motion on that item. All those in favour, please indicate. Thank you, members. Put your hands down. Those against? Any abstentions? No. Members, that's 24, none against, and 10 abstentions. That is carried. Okay. Members moving back to agenda item 10, business from local council office, local of, sorry, let's start it. Business from local last council meeting. Members, does anyone have any questions relating to the business from the last council meeting held on the 14th of June? Okay, thank you, members. Agenda item 11, report on urgent decisions. There are none. Agenda item 12, report of the leader on the work of the executive. Members, is that noted? Noted, Chairman. Thank you. Item 13, public questions and member questions on notice. Members, there are none. Item 14, motions on notice. Members, we have one motion on notice this evening from Councillor Mrs. Mason and Councillor Hoy. Councillor Mrs. Mason, would you like to introduce your motion on notice? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. The motion has been circulated, and I think in view of the time of the evening and the fact that I'm sure everyone's read it, I won't read the motion out. I will speak to it. I'm sure that will be acceptable. Firstly, I'd like to thank the officers for their help in drafting this motion. This council... Excuse me if I read, won't you? It's easier. This council has an objective of building homes for residents, as outlined in our local plan. Yet our residents are facing unprecedented difficulties. 
Whilst Rochford District Council cannot alleviate most of those problems, we can at least attempt to future-proof our buildings. I accept that the government may legislate on this in future, but I say no reason why RDC cannot be ahead of the curve in this simple respect. Fitting photophotocallic panels will not only help the residents occupying these premises, but will help our country as a whole, as excess electricity will be fed back to the grid for the benefit of all. You may ask why one kilowatt per hour? The average house has a bad base load of one half a kilowatt per hour. So this would enable the base load to be covered during peak times and some excesses for other electrical uses. To produce this level of electricity with the present technology would require up to three panels, which most properties should be able to accommodate. Points to consider. Installing such energy produces elements into our properties that would not only reduce household bills but also provide a small income from the amount fed to the national grid. Last July, a 12-month fixed supply agreement cost £3 per kilowatt for gas and 18 pounds, uh, 18 pence, sorry, 3 pence and 18p. See what nerves do to you uh, for electricity plus the daily standing charge of around 25p for each fuel. A current plan being offered this month is 17.77 per kilowatt hour for gas and 53.7 for electricity, with standing charges of 27.22 and 46.26 for electricity. A 300% increase on the electricity unit costs and a nearly 200% increase on the standing charge. As a, council, uh, as a council, I'm sure we wish to do all we can to assist our residents against <coughs> this particular costs of living increase, which is likely to get worse. Indeed, the money-saving expert states that the energy price cap is predicted to raise by 65% in October, bringing a typical bill to £3,240 per annum and will rise again in January. We can't help our existing customers, but we can prevent some future hardship for our residents. Some points to consider. Photovoltaic panels systems are more cost effective to install when building rather than retrofitting. Developers would be able to bulk buy. Once the system is installed, it is easy to add to either enlarge or add battery storage, should that be so desired. Our planners would be able to consider the roof angles and polarisation at application stage to maximise production. I do hope that this council will see the benefit of this motion and support it. Thank you. Councillor Hoy, are you seconding that uh, yes, motion? Uh, Yes, I will second the motion. Can I reserve my right to speak? Certainly, Mr. Councillor Hoy. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I completely support this as well. Um, I have one question. The last paragraph talks about the exceptions because of sensitivities. I assume we're talking about the uh, settings such as the um, conservation area and whatnot. And what have the planners said with regards to that? Are they going to protect our conservation areas? That, um, and would that be written in that are, they are going to protect that from these sort of um, these panels from going in? If I may, Mr Chairman, I can answer that. It, it, that was drafted by, that sentence was actually drafted by the planners and they were happy that that gave us sufficient, sufficient protection. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mrs Belton. I wholeheartedly support any motion that goes to support what we do as council and policy in regards to energy efficiency and building and planning. Um, I do have a couple of concerns. Um, I work in the solar industry, although I don't do new builds, so just to put that out there. You, to fit three solar panels on a roof is actually pretty counterproductive. Whilst you can add panels and increase system size, you have to then change the inverter, re-scaffold, to fit a battery then needs a hybrid inverter. 
you can't mix panels, so you have to be able to hope that the panels that are originally on the roof are still in supply. So whilst I support the, I support the motion and I support what's being achieved here, I really wouldn't want to see us box ourselves into a corner in saying have three panels installed. That should be a bare minimum. No solar installer would only install three panels. A one kilowatt system is, is not a, a good system. Um, so I appreciate the intent. I appreciate that something is better than nothing. But my concern is if every new build property was built with three solar panels on its roof, they would never have more panels than that. And really, every system should be eight or nine panels where it can fit. So I, I just wanted to put that bit of sort of thought out there just because I don't want to see us box ourselves into a corner. Thank you. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just like to add uh, some information that, that might be of use. Um, at the current time, both the National Planning Policy Framework, paragraphs 154 and 155, fully support the use of renewable energies, but neither they or building regulations mandate the use of solar panels or renewable energy generation across all buildings, whilst taking account that all measures should reflect the government's policy for national technical standards. However, the Council's own policy, ENV7, for small-scale projects, and ENV8, which currently requires developers on sites of five or more to demonstrate how 10% of their energy would be sourced from decentralised, low carbon and renewable sources. The proposal contained within the motion would seek to extend the requirements of this policy, which I understand. The principle of the proposal can be taken forward in an advice note or similar guidance note. However, it should be recognised that any such note would be advisory in nature and would not hold the same weight as an adopted policy that had been taken through the local plan process. The Council is unable to bring forward <coughs> mandatory planning policies or extend existing policies outside of the formal local plan process. Nevertheless, the Council is currently working on a new local plan which will contain ambitious policies with respect to renewable energy generation which will form the basis for future decision making once adopted and contribute to Rochford District Council's goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. Understanding of these constraints, I am content that the motion can be taken forward as presented. So I do support it. Thank you. Members, I do have a couple more speakers, but we are very close to our maximum time. So members, I need to put a motion forward that are you happy that we extend the time, let's say by half an hour, I think that will more than cover it. Um, do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Wilkinson, thank you. Members, those in favour? Please indicate. against? No. 
Any abstentions? Okay, members, that's um, 4, 14 against 17, no abstentions. Members, we've got how many minutes? 13, 13 minutes. I have two speakers. Um, so I will ask those two speakers to be as quick as they possibly can, uh, and then we'll go to the vote after those two speakers. Councillor Foster. I believe Councillor Ward has probably covered most of the points I was going to make. Um, I'm happy to support the motion. I believe it's broadly as presented. Oops, sorry. Sorry, Chairman. Right. Um, I'm happy to support the motion. Um, it's, as it's presented, it's broadly uh, in line with existing policies. And uh, I made several points, but uh, Councillor Ward has covered them. I just remind everybody that in the planning policy for the evolving 2025 local plan, the intended ambition is that the sustainability target will be go way beyond the scope of this motion, net zero in fact, subject to legal and emerging NPPF uh, policies. And as Council Ward has pointed out, we would expect within that actually to have, be creating uh, developments that generate uh, net positives in, uh, in energy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Councillor Newport, very quickly, if you would, please. Chairman, quite briefly, uh, fully supportive of this motion. Um, I think this is probably born out of frustration of the snail's pace of uh, government legislation and uh, the new local plan coming forward. So, um, fully behind this, I think it's a good uh, motion. I think, um, just picking up on one of the points that uh, Councillor Belton made earlier about these systems and being upgradable in the future, I think we strongly need to look at how we uh, challenge that issue um, when, we, when we're um, put laying down policy for developers and how that's going to future-proof or potentially future-proof the, um, the systems that, that are implemented. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Hoyt, did you wish to... No, Councillor Constable. Sorry? Councillor Constable. Councillor Constable, sorry. <coughs> apologies. Sorry? Yes. As quickly as you can. I'd just uh, like to remind members that this motion has already been covered on the new Part L of the building regulations, which came into force in June this year. And it has also been well covered by the latest SAP regulations, which encourage the generation of electricity. Uh, the only bit I'm a little bit concerned about is the, where the motion speaks about other means of regeneration and doesn't specify anything. Um, that's just the bits that concern me. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I won't take any more speakers on this. Councillor Hoy, did you wish to come back? As quickly as you possibly can, please. A bit unfortunate, I had a brilliant speech written for a change, and you're not going to hear it now. Um, thank you for the support from the administration. Um, it's very welcome. I think some of the points we are covered in here, but this is a small step, which hopefully we can improve later on. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. OK. Councillor Mrs Mason, uh, can I just quickly ask you to summarise your motion as briefly as you possibly can? That'll be fine. Thank you. Members. Well, as written, sorry. As written, yes. Uh, members, that motion is before you. Those who are happy to support, please indicate in the normal manner. Those against? Any abstentions? Okay. okay. Uh, it's 4.30 against zero and abstentions zero. Thank you, members. That motion is carried.
Members, just before I close the meeting, I would like to say a few words of thanks to the lady sitting on my left here, the very director, Angela Hutchins. This is her last meeting. She joined the council in 2017 from Essex, uh, Essex Loss, our gain, and also acted as head of paid services and MD from November 2020 through to August 2021, and was also the returning officer. I'd like to add my personal thanks, as I had the opportunity to work with Angela, both as deputy leader and leader. I'd like to thank her for all the help she has given. And I'm sure, and I'll ask if anybody else wishes to speak, but I'm sure members will join me in saying thank you for everything that you've done. Hope that the job goes well. And I'm sure this is not going to be the last we see of you because you're only over the border. So uh, hopefully we'll see. Does anybody else wish to add anything to it? Councillor Wooten. I too would like to um, uh, say a huge thank you to uh, Angela. Uh, <coughs> we first got to know each other, shall I say, more closely um, when we were working on the Beagle project. Um, and that was a project to promote tourism. And Angela's personal enthusiasm to make that project happen and really raise the profile on something fantastic, actually, uh, in terms of all the other uh, things it was dragging in was really positive. Uh, and then a little thing called COVID came along uh, and unfortunately uh, that particular project fizzled out through absolutely no fault of Angela's. Um, but then it was overtaken uh, in November, well, November 20, we were well into it, but uh, the previous managing director had decided to retire and Angela moved into uh, the post of interim managing director. Uh, and that's where, as leader, I work very, very closely with Angela and everything that we did together um, was faced with the same enthusiasm and uh, approach of let's make it happen. Uh, and. Um, you know, at that time, we were delivering grants to businesses. Let's remind, over £35 million uh, was delivered to uh, local businesses. The challenges of ma maintaining our services, our refuse collection, planning services, licensing, and all the things that we needed to do. And Angela was all over the place in terms of um, making sure that the, uh, uh, you know, the, the council delivered on those things. And then some leader came along and said, hey, um, why don't we think about a partnership approach with uh, uh, another authority? So again, Angela launched into that. So we've had um, several big projects as well as running business as usual. Um, I have to say, really sorry to see you go, Angela, but absolutely delighted that you're staying as a partner uh, with us in South Essex. And I think that is for the strength of South Essex and a seller. I seem to spend quite a bit of time in Castle Point these days. So I'm sure our paths are gonna probably cross, not quite as much as historically, uh, but it certainly uh, on behalf of uh, members, I would like to thank you for your huge contribution over the years and wish you every success in Castle Point. Thank you very much indeed. Members, I'm sure you're happy for me to wish Angela all the best. It's Castle Point's gain and our loss. Councillor Mrs Mason. The, the uh, majority didn't want us to be at past 10 o'clock. I'll be as brief as I can. Um, which I'm very good at doing, as you've probably noticed. I first met Angela at the interview, and I was surprised to hear tonight that that was five years ago. <laughs> it doesn't seem five years ago, I can assure you. I'm going to be brief because I, we have a guillotine on us time-wise, and I will say that the council is going to regret you leaving, but at the same time, we wish you all the best for the future, and I'm sure you will have a happy and successful career at Castle Point. So, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyway, all the best, Angela. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you, Angela. Thank you.
Members, I'm not sure if it's a sad note that we're leaving her, she's leaving us, or it's a happy note that she's joining <laughs> Castle Point. I'm not sure which way to go with that. But, members, thank you, and I'll close the meeting at that point. Thank you. Members, please be outstanding.